Uh, thank you, President Marion. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, uh, Karen Fifield, uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Wellington uh, Zoo. Um, Karen was born in Australia, but she is a naturalised New Zealander, or should I say a naturised uh, New Zealander now. Um, and she worked in zoos in Australia for about 15 years, I think it was, and saw the light and came over to uh, Wellington to become chief executive of the, uh, of the Wellington Zoo back, I think, about 2006. Um, and since then, uh, Karen has set the world alight. She's transformed the Wellington Zoo into an award-winning zoo with a focus on, on uh, learning and conservation. Um, and made it an integral part of the Wellington economy. Um, they get over 180,000 visitors uh, a year now, going through through the through the zoo. Um, she's active in both business and uh, community uh, uh, circles. Uh, she's a member of the New Zealand Sustainability Business Council Advisory Council, the Newtown Festival Board, and chair of the Netball uh, uh, Centre, amongst the other things that uh, she does. Her business and community uh, contributions have been recognised by being made a member of the New Zealand Order of, uh, of Merit. And uh, she's uh, won some Wellington and National um, HER Awards for business leadership and sustainability and was made Wellington of the Year in 2010 in the conservation the environment category. Uh, our clubs work pretty closely with the Wellington Zoo and Karen over the years in strategic planning, tree planting, and contributing to gear and equipment for the, uh, uh, the animal hospital. So Karen is now going to return the favour because our club is trying to become carbon zero uh, rated, and um, she has led the zoo through that process, so they are carbon rate zero rated, and she's going to give us some guidance on how to do that. So. Uh, Karen, welcome. Thank you, Russ. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's very nice to be with you all today. I see a lot of familiar faces. There is one person sitting in the room who was actually on my interview panel, and that's Denise Church. So you've got her to blame. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what a progressive zoo is like and I will get to the sustainability work a little bit later but this is just a, a context for you about why sustainability is important for a progressive zoo. In the world there are probably 10,000 or more organisations that call themselves zoos of some description or other. They are not all progressive zoos, believe you me. I sit on a lot of international committees um, around this particular issue. So I want to talk a little bit about what progressive zoos are like that are dif is different. So someone asked me the other day, how can you tell if the zoo you're visiting is actually progressive? And I said, well, ask them questions. Are they accredited in some way? So we are animal welfare accredited, for example, actually using the five domains model, which was developed at Massey University, <coughs> which is now the way we accredit all the zoos that belong to the Australasian region. And it's also part of the global strategy for animal welfare. And that was all set up by Professor David Mellor from Massey. And he worked closely with us on a global level to actually think about what does animal welfare look like in a progressive zoo. So it was very important for us that you ask those questions. Are they accredited? Do they belong to an association that has some rigour around what is a zoo. So there are two organisations I want to mention. The first one is the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So of that 10,000, anyone want to hazard a guess how many of those are members, institutional members of WAZA? So they are members through their region. A quarter, okay. Anyone else? 280. That's the difference. So to be a member of the global organisation that supports and, and leads progressive zoos, you've got to actually get some runs on the board. 
So this is an organisation, I sit on the Animal Welfare Committee for this global organisation. I also sit on the Conservation and Sustainability Committee and I run the subcommittee for sustainability for the World Association. I've just come back from our conference in Bangkok um, where we won a global award, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but also what was interesting there is we spent time at that conference working with the Thai government to close down a bad zoo which is not a member, by the way, but we decided that we were there, so we were going to speak. And this organisation um, really wants to lift the game around the world, but does not <coughs> seek to support organisations that don't do the right thing by the animals. The other one I want to talk about is the Zoo and Aquarium Association, which is our regional association. I was president for four years of this association when we made the shift to animal welfare accreditation as our main way of assessing our membership. So the other thing with WASA is that unless you are animal welfare accredited by some way through your regional association, you cannot be a member of WASA post 2023. At the conference, we also signed another MOU. We have a number of MOUs globally, some with UN Environment to work for plastics in the ocean to remove those, one with um, the Round Table for Sustainable Palm Oil, and we just signed one at this last conference for FSC, which is Foreign Stewardship Council, Timber. So I'll be leading the delivery of that MOU globally. So the focus for progressive zoos pretty much is like this house. So there's a whole range of things that sit underneath that are, are really like hygiene factors about things that you must do if you want to be seen as a progressive zoo. So obviously what we're tra all trying to aim for is to save animals in the wild. And so how do we do that through a zoo-led conservation process or a zoo-led conservation and sustainability process? And that's what progressive zoos grapple with all the time. Zoos around the world get about 700 million people visiting them every year. <coughs> and I will correct Russ, we've got a quarter of a million people coming to Wellington Zoo. Um, and that's growing. And it's growing all around the world. So if we could have every one of those people do something differently after a visit to the zoo, what a huge mass of critical, of, a critical change that we've got going on. So the most important thing we think about is really about behaviour change which leads, of course, to good outcomes for animals in the field. So our strategy at Wellington Zoo, I'm a big fan of strategy on a page. I don't like lots of really big strategy documents because everyone forgets them. So these are, this is our strategy. And if you asked my team, I think they'd all be able to tell you what those four pillars were. People love and support the zoo. We lead the way, we connect people with animals and we save animals in the wild. And then they can understand how their work fits in to that revolution that we're trying to create around Wellington Zoo being unique in the world. And underpinning all of that for Wellington Zoo is actually our values. The values piece was very important for me as the chief executive because the vision and the strategy can be sort of a little bit out there for a lot of people, but they, they certainly understand how we treat each other, how things actually happen in the zoo. So we did a fair amount of work with Taranaki Whanui, looking at what were the concepts that would actually underpin Wellington Zoo. And we landed totally on Manaki Tanga. And I remember presenting this a few years back now to Celia, and she said to me, I thought it would be Kaitiaki Tanga. And I said, well, that's where we started off, but actually it is about welcoming people into a place that is theirs. We are just the custodians. So it really is about Manaki Tanga for us. So as many of you will know, we've been through a huge capital development program at the zoo, and this has been over the last 10 to 12 years, and it's obviously ongoing. It's really interesting. We used to think about building zoo experiences for about a 20-year lifespan. At this last conference, I was just talking to some zoo directors from the US, and they're talking about 10 years now. They're saying things are moving so fast in the animal welfare space, in the visitor experience space, in the behaviour change space, that probably 10 years is it. So that's quite an interesting change, and the momentum globally is quite enormous. So underpinning that strategy was all of these things that go to actually making those strategies come alive. And what we do is we talk about how do we do these things. Connecting people with animals is the start of many people's journey. 
You know, for a lot of people, particularly in urban environments, and we're very lucky in Wellington that we have an amazing urban environment, <coughs> that is not the case around the world. So for many people, seeing animals like this up close happens in their zoo. I've just come back from the bear sanctuaries in Laos that we support as part of one of our conservation partners. And um, my friend who runs the sanctuary said, oh, will you come and talk to my staff about animal welfare? And I thought, well, my Laos pretty bad but maybe someone can understand and then they can translate it. So I took our little um, five minute video on animal welfare and I was showing it to all of Matt's staff and all his construction team was there, all the keepers, and when they were seeing animals like giraffes and, and tigers and lions, they were like, oh, like this, because they had never seen one before. And then when they got, we got to sun bears, then they sort of were feeling a whole lot better because they had seen sun bears before. So those, those experiences are quite magical for people. So we have to make them meaningful as well as magical. And then people loving and supporting the zoo, actually coming and visiting the zoo helps us to do this conservation work and sustainability work. And we work with partners all around New Zealand, like the warehouse and like other corporate partners that actually help us do this work. And these are some of the people that we work with around New Zealand. And then we also have national partners in terms of conservation outcomes. We work a lot with Kia Conservation Trust and a lot more these days with West Coast Penguin Trust. Some of you may have seen the nest to core hunger. We, we measure our direct, um, a percentage of direct field conservation every year. So the American Zoo Association developed this measurement where you can take out the advocacy component of what you're doing and actually look at what's your field component only, the direct spend to conservation. So 50% of our direct field conservation comes out of our animal hospital. So thank you for all that support over the years. Um, we've just received an amazing grant from Wellington Community Trust to buy even more equipment for this state-of-the-art facility. So that's a very important part of what we do. Our veterinary care and conservation medicine, I think, will grow. I think it's an area that's just going to go ahead leaps and bounds. And then globally, we work with a range of conservation partners supporting animals that are critically endangered in the field. Our staff go to these places, like I just went to the bear sanctuaries. We've got a keeper going there in February. So a lot of them get to do this through our conservation staff grants. And then, of course, the big one, the sustainability one. We were the first, the world's first carbon zero certified zoo. We started this journey probably looking at environmental sustainability probably back 2004, 2005. So when I got here in 2006, it was like, well, what, what does this look like going forward? And how are we actually going to be reducing our carbon as an organisation? So we ploughed on, we did all this stuff. And, and then in about 2012, we got a grant through DIA to see if where we were in terms of being able to be certified. We didn't think we were ready. Uh, we had a consultant come in from Becker and he said, yeah, you're ready. And I'm like, mm, I don't think we are. Enviromark Solutions then came in and had a look at the data that we'd collected. They did the audit. They said it was the, the quickest audit they've ever done. So one of my messages to people about sustainability is always just start. It doesn't have to be perfect. So if you want to do something, even small things can make a huge difference. We didn't realise how far down the track we were because we were polishing that apple till it started to go rotten on the inside. So we just needed to get moving and get this certification. It's been quite phenomenal. This is our sixth year now that we've been audited. We've just received another audit and passed it this year. But we've reset our base. Because one of the things about Carbon Zero is that it's all very well to pay offsets, but what they want is to, for you to reduce. So it's no good saying, oh, we're just going to increase our offsets. They won't, they won't certify you if you do that. So we've had a lot of success in terms of reducing our carbon by about 5% per annum. So we've actually got big targets ahead of us as well. We've just shifted our um, electricity supplier to Ecotricity because they are the only carbon zero certified supplier in the country. So that gave us a huge saving because we were getting our power through a carbon zero certified person. We only ever use um, taxis combined because green cabs are great, but they're not certified. So you've got to be able to 
be able to pick and choose and say, well, this is what I want to do. This is how we're going to support our carbon zero results. Um, we've moved two of our cars to EVs because our biggest um, carbon emitter is our power. We've got 24-7 heating and cooling. We've got 700 animals. We have to make sure they're okay. So that's our biggest carbon emitter. So reducing our power is actually what we are really focusing on. We've done a lot of work in terms of waste to landfill, a lot of work in terms of water. Um, we do measure our animals' methane, but it's pretty tiny. And really no one's got a measurement for a giraffe. <laughs> so we had to use a goat. So it's all, it all gets quite funny sometimes. But I was saying to Russ before, we've just shifted our carbon audit to our financial people because it's exactly the same as a financial audit. They need to get the data, they need to actually ratify it and make sure that the data is collected is right. <coughs> but the board chair at the time, when we became Carbon Zero, he's a business guy, he, you know, you know, get on with the business, Karen. But when we got this, I've never seen him so excited about anything. He was so excited about getting this, and it is a huge achievement. And I, even, you know, like all our staff, really just, it's something that everyone can get behind and that everyone can sort of feel good about if you're doing that. Um, uh, another friend of mine runs a, a um, like, uh, ad agency, and they became Carbon Zero certified, and they actually found it a lot easier than it is for us. So I think if you're thinking about doing that for the club, I think you'd be very surprised how close you might be. And then you've got to decide what your parameters are going to be around that. But I think you'd probably find that it'd be pretty easy for you to get. And Environmark Solutions will help you with that, of course. So in terms of that, we have won a lot of awards, as Russ said. And the most recent one was the inaugural award at the World Association Conference for Environmental Sustainability. And I was pretty excited about that because no one else can win the inaugural. Um, and it's funny because my friend uh, Ron Kagan, who does a lot of animal welfare work, a lot of sustainability work at Detroit Zoo, he was sitting at the table and he tried to steal it from me. And I said, well, you can't have it. You can have it next year, but you're not getting the inaugural one. So it was really quite interesting because people, we're really known for our sustainability work. And people were coming up to me at the conference and saying, well, if you hadn't won that award, Karen, we were going to boycott the awards. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of Wellington Zoo and our reputation amongst those progressive zoos in the world, we really are renowned for sustainability. And we're always happy to help anyone who's wanting to go down this track, to sit with you, talk about what we did, you know, talk about what does our audit look like, where do we, we do, our offsets go to a place called Pigeon Bush, in Featherston, and so that's an area of regenerating forest, so that's where our offsets go to. And that's it from me. Thank you. This is our latest additions, if you haven't seen them. They are as cute as cute, let me tell you. And I don't know what their methane output would be. <laughs> yes, of course. Questions? Gloria, and then... It is great fun to go to that zoo. <laughs> for adults, for visitors, you don't have to be a child. No. So do you have new programs? The interactivity with the MUs and being able just to walk around is an incredible experience for outsiders. We bring a lot of tourists around. What new programs do you have to add to that type of uh, interactivity? There's, we're actually opening on the 17th of December our new chimp park. Um, and it's going to be quite amazing because we're going to have a lot of parallel play between the kids and the, and the chimps. And so kids pretending to be chimps, chimps pretending to be kids. But it's been quite amazing seeing the chimps themselves, seeing all the new poles going in there and the big nests that are really high. So there'll be a lot more activity for them. So chimps, are, are, chimps like to have fission and fusion, so come together, come apart as much as possible. So that's opening on the 17th of December. It's going to be fun. We've been watching all the big... And what's been great about that is all the poles that have gone in are the old cable car poles. So we've recycled them through the cable car company. So Simon Fleischer and I have been saying, how many more poles have you got? So it's been very cool that we've been able to recycle them. Roger. Oh, thanks, Karen. Very inspiring and uh, very helpful to hear what you're saying about becoming a carbon zero zoo as mm. we're going down that, that track. So could you just say a bit more about how much effort was involved in all the certification processes, etc., 
And what has it meant to your customers and to your staff? Um, as far as the work, there is a lot of work. There's a lot of data collection. For us, I think, as I was, that's what I was saying about when Dan went through this with his business, it was less because they had paper and they had travel and they had things like that, but they didn't have the power problem that we've got and the data around that. So I think it depends on the size of the business, how much work it is, or um, size of the organisation. So, yeah, it depends. And Enviromark Solutions are the best people to actually um, understand this. Um, we're actually working with them on a project at the moment through the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they're trying to look at a way of, of actually certifying organisations for SDGs. And I'm running a global um, strategy for WAZA to look at how do zoos work across sustainable development goals. And for a lot of um, progressive zoos, that's going to be around getting certifications like Carbon Zero. So everyone's going to have a different approach to it. For our staff, it was really important because for me, like we could go and do the global conservation work and the local conservation work, but what are we doing as an organisation to reduce our carbon footprint? Because it's two sides of the one coin to me. So you can be a conservation-led organisation, but you've also got to have sustainability at your heart as well. So for them, they understood that. For our customers, I think what happens in Wellington is that people in Wellington expect their organisations to be the best they can be. And so the expectation is that you will do this. That's, that's my feeling, that sustainability is at the heart of what Wellington is as a city and as a region. Yeah. Of Russ. Thanks, Karen. That was uh, that was great. Um, a lot of us will remember from our early days when we went to zoos, and uh, they would not have met your uh, definition of uh, a progressive zoo. So it's good to have uh, I've got that definition. You know, where the <laughs> ultimate objective is saving animals in the wild, and then operating your uh, your facility, you know, based on. Uh, connecting people with animals and uh, underpinned by sound animal welfare and uh, sustainability uh, uh, principles. I got two messages out of the Carbon Zero project. Just get started. Um, don't get put off by you know, how much administration you may have to do and how much data you've got to collect. And the second one, which I think is a good reminder to this club, that it's probably not good just to buy your way into it. So uh, put away those checkbooks, everyone, and start reducing your carbon uh, you know, emissions as a contribution to us becoming uh, carbon zero uh, rated, because that's what really makes a difference. Karen, in recognition, can I give you a small little gift from Thank us you, as Russ. a reminder? Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody.